it's the festival of Losar, Tibetan New Year, and in the mountain outpost of the Tibetan exiles, prayers to summon good fortune for the future. Devotees raise holy flags and a hundred thousand prayers fly up to heaven. But this new year, good luck has come early. One of the highest lamas in Tibet, sanctioned and fated by China, has fled to join the exile community in Dharamsala. He's the Kamapa Lama, and his presence here is a very public vindication that Beijing's attempt to win over Tibetan Buddhism in support of China's occupation is failing badly. In Dharamsala this new year, there is cause to celebrate. This is Beijing's Buddhist showpiece, the 300-year-old Lama Temple. These days, it's a permanent fixture on the tourist trail. Everywhere is evidence of China's unshakable belief of a long and distinct history of sovereignty over Tibet. So now, the Xi'an is a very special place for the Chinese government and the whole country. The Lama Temple is a microcosm of how China would like Tibetan Buddhism to be. Controlled and patriotic, where living Buddhas like the Dalai Lama don't dabble in politics. You say Dalai looks very smart, very intelligent, very beneficent. 那么为什么中国政府不能容忍他？我说你们只是看到了他的一个方面，他要分裂一个国家，要恢复政教合一的传统的这样一种制度。那么这无论对中国来说，无论对西藏的人民来说，这都是一种倒退。For years, Communist China's focus was to destroy the power of the monasteries, to break the hold of religion on Tibetan politics. But in the 80s and 90s, Beijing switched tack, injecting billions of dollars into Tibet's economy, trying to co-opt Buddhism and win Tibetan hearts and minds. According to Chinese writer Wang Lixiong, whose recent book on Tibet has been banned, the Kamapa was central to this game plan. The Kamapa heads the Kagyu or Black Hat sect of Buddhism and by virtue of that is one of Tibet's most influential lamas. After an 11-year search, regents for the Dalai Lama identified Ergun Trinli Dorje as the latest reincarnation of the Kamapa Lama. A lavish enthronement took place in 1992 the head of China's Religious Affairs Bureau paid his respects. That Beijing and the Dalai Lama had jointly approved the choice was a watershed in what had been an uneasy existence between an atheist state and its deeply spiritual charge. When China's leaders were told of the Kamapa's escape, Beijing's Tibet strategy lay in shreds. The defection of one of China's most accepted and sanctioned lamas exposed the sham of religious tolerance. If the Kamapa had been free to continue his work and studies in Tibet, then why did he defect? 
That's a question Beijing isn't prepared to acknowledge. The government says the Kamapa left to collect religious relics taken abroad by his predecessor. But if the Kamapa went to collect relics, it was a strange route he took. Like other exiles before him, including the Dalai Lama, the journey is a long and hazardous trek across the Himalayas. For all Tibetan exiles, it's an arduous journey. This young man arrived a month ago, as scores of others arrive every week. He wants to remain anonymous because someday he plans to return to Tibet to push for independence. It was pitch dark. We were not allowed to use any torch lights. And far away on the right side, you can see the light of the Chinese military camp. And uh, yeah, everybody sort of, you know, saying, telling people not to talk loudly, keep it down. Tenzin Chergul knows the escape route well. As a child Lama, he fled Tibet in 1959 with his brother, the Dalai Lama. You know, people who cross into Nepal, uh, you know, they just uh, go through such a lot of problem, you know, very high mountains, just risking, risking everything. They want to be free. And, uh, and uh, some of these passes are never sort of, uh, you know, are you so tried before and they just come out. So what I'm trying to say is, if you really want to do it badly enough, you can do it. This is peak season for refugee arrivals. Each year, about 2,500 make the hazardous journey across the Himalayas, a journey which ends here. The new arrivals tell us that winter is the best time to escape from China because there are fewer border patrols once the snow sets in. At the refugee centre, they land tired and hungry. They have no home, no job, and barely any money. Yet another busload has come in today, Tibetan New Year. The hard climate has left its mark on children sent by poor parents to be educated in their mother tongue. Like the Kamapa, many are the victims of growing restrictions on Tibet's religious education.而且有学校了，但是都是给中国的所谓的共产党员或者是别的机关干部吧，给他们的直立读书的地方。对我们来说啊，根本没有机会。而且他他所宣传的啊，中国政府所有所有的最最喜欢宣传宣传的啊，他
Tibet's religious scholars feel increasingly stifled by Beijing's obsession with patriotic education. Those close to the Kamapa confirm his education was a primary cause of dissatisfaction. We have been receiving uh, reports in the last number of years that uh, he was having difficulties for um, uh, for not being you know, difficulties with receiving teachings from uh, from uh, lamas uh, of different traditions uh, and, and high lamas of his own tradition uh, as part of his religious education. He's also having difficulties of receiving uh, uh, visitors and. Um, and uh, that we have had r reports which caused us a great deal of concern that uh, he was not very happy. With the teenage Lama now ensconced at the Gyutu Monastery in Dharamsala, the faithful wait for their first meeting with him. There are devout Tibetans and some curious foreigners. Together, we wait under the watchful eye of the Indian army. Finally, we're called into the monastery. But there are rules. No jackets, shoes or socks. The Indian government is so sensitive about the Kamapa's presence, not even cameras and watches are allowed inside. And for everybody, two body searches. Even for toddlers, there's no escape. While life goes on as usual outside the monastery, inside it's an extraordinary 10 minutes with the Kamapa. He delivers a modest message of peace and tranquility but his physical presence transcends his words. The Kamapa may be only 14, but already his incredible spiritual presence leaves a deep and lasting impression. As the faithful depart, the Kamapa finally makes a more public appearance. Despite the high security, he appears relaxed in his new home, in no apparent rush to return to Tibet. Though no one dares to say it now, it's an unspoken conclusion that India will grant him refuge. The government of India has never at any stage said that he cannot uh, stay. Um, so I don't think there is um, uh, you know, a formal procedure to be adopted. But still China battles to control the Tibetan soul. In recent weeks, state television has showcased the child lama chosen by Beijing as the second most important figure in Tibetan Buddhism, the Panchen Lama. In May 1995, the Dalai Lama named his own choice of Panchen Lama. China was so infuriated, it nullified the choice, and the boy disappeared. Six months later, Beijing's nominee was instated, the son of Communist Party members. In recent weeks, China's leaders have appeared in the company of the young Panchen, projecting an image that since the Kamapa's flight, all is well on the roof of the world. <laughs> what do you think were the reasons why the young Kamapa fled from Tibet? Because he didn't have freedom. He felt that he was being used as a puppet. See, when you are in a prison, the prison, prison wardens have all the say. And, uh, it, yeah, even though you might have little kind of freedom, but then someone's always watching you. If you cross the line, you know, you get the chop. <laughs> From here you can see, you know the river right there, it's Beas, River Beas, one of the rivers of uh, Punjab. Mm -hmm. Tenzin Chergul has renounced his monkhood. 
These days, he prefers a different type of solitude, running a small guest house which was once part of a British hill station. It's a quiet existence where protecting his guests has become a more worldly concern than meditation. One of his main occupations these days is keeping monkeys well away from the guest house. You're going to be slingshotting the monkeys. Does it hurt? Oh, yeah, if you hit them, it'll hurt. But oh. we only do it to frighten them, frighten them away. Okay. Please mind your head here. Thank you. But there is a more serious side to harassing the wildlife. The traditional slingshot has achieved near-mythical status amongst Tibetans. Hundreds of years ago, it was used to fight the Chinese. And in history, there is an incident where Tibetans use sling against an emperor's army. And that's why people wear this kind of thing around their neck, reminding us that we drove them away by slings. You, you got to choose the right kind of stone. Just physical overpowering a person uh, doesn't ensure the person's, you know, uh, how do you say, goodwill towards you. They haven't won the heart of the Tibetan people. Why, after 40 years, are Tibetans still unhappy with Chinese rule? <laughs> Uh 的这样的人呢是极少数 You see, if you want to make friends, you can't bash the person and say, you know, be my friend. If you treat the person well, have a certain amount of trust and faith in each other, have some kind of a human interaction, then you might become friends. <laughs> The exiles stand firm in their resolve that someday, in some form, they will return to their own land. Already there are whispers that sometime in the future, the Kamapa may succeed the Dalai Lama, a role presently reserved for Beijing's puppet pension. China may have won Tibet's physical submission, but the spiritual crown lies far beyond its reach.